Hello everyone and welcome back to First Friday Fives at Go Big Bore or Go Home, where recoil is required. I'm your host Sean, and this month we are going to look at five more Big Bore handgun cartridges that were designed to be chocolate eclairs, but ended up as turds. Granted, this is part three of this type of list, and probably our last as we're running out of cartridges that were as well-liked as Millhouse was in The Simpsons. Nobody likes Millhouse! Poor Millhouse. But without further ado, here are five more Big Bore handgun cartridges that failed epically. Number 5. The 500 Wyoming Express When it comes to claimed performance, the 500 Wyoming Express does deliver. It's a ballistic twin of the 500 Linebaugh and the 500 JRH, so it isn't hype. But the reason the 500 Wyoming Express is on this list is why it was made in the first place. When converting a revolver to 500 line baw, the large bullet diameter of .510 inches and the large rim on the brass requires a much larger cylinder to hold the cartridges, even for five shots. That means the cylinder window in the revolver's frame has to be opened up to allow the cylinder to function properly. If you're converting a gun like a Ruger Super Blackhawk, that may not be so bad, but having to carve up a Freedom Arms Model 83 would definitely make anyone cringe. To solve this issue, the 500 JRH was designed to be the same 1.4 inch brass length as the line baw, but with a smaller rim and using a .500 inch bullet to be able to keep cylinder size down, meaning less modification to the cylinder window, if any. And the use of .500 inch bullets made reloading materials much easier to get. That was released in 2004. In 2005, Freedom Arms announced the 500 Wyoming Express for the Model 83. Its brass case was 1.373 inches long, and instead of having a rimmed case, it had a belted case. You might think that the belt is needed for pressure reasons, but the 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum has much higher pressures and does not need a belt, so that's not the case. I would hazard a guess that the belt, and shorter brass length, were to keep it legally distinct from other cartridges. Now what I am about to say is one guy's opinion, and I cannot confirm this. But what this looked like to me at the time, and honestly still does, is that Freedom Arms wanted to have their very own proprietary 50 caliber cartridge. Some folks might say, yeah, so what if they did? My response is, why do it in the first place? The 500 Wyoming Express doesn't do anything unique or special the way that the 454 Casul did when Freedom Arms released that cartridge, so what was the selling point beyond, we made this? Does this remind anyone of the 450 Magnum Express from part two of this series? There was some factory ammo made by a few small companies like Grizzly, but it has all been discontinued and the company that was making the brass initially, Jameson, went under in 2019. You can't make your own as there is no parent cartridge, so unlike the 500 JRH and 500 Linebaugh, you have to specifically hunt down the correct brass. Good luck with that. The only company that makes a gun in 500 Wyoming Express is Freedom Arms, and I've never heard of anyone asking for a revolver to be converted to it considering how much better off you'd be in terms of reloading supplies if you converted to 500 JRH. With limited revolvers in it available, and brass becoming more and more scarce, I'd say the 500 Wyoming Express's days are numbered. Number 4. The 50 Guncrafter Industries Why did the cowboy buy a 45? Because they don't make a 46. If that joke describes you, then this cartridge was specifically designed for you. The 50GI resembles a shorter version of the 50 Action Express and is significantly less powerful as it was designed to be more in line with the recoil of a 45 ACP. It has very similar ballistics with a 230 grain solid copper hollow point at 1000 feet per second. It does this by using a much shorter brass casing, 0.899 inches, and a significantly lower pressure, 15,000 psi, than that of the 50AE's 36,000 psi. From my understanding, the creator, Alex Zimmerman, wanted to create a 50 caliber cartridge that could be shot out of a 1911 and one that could be used for self-defense. And Guncrafter Industries makes several high-end 1911s chambered for the round. They also make a conversion kit for Glock models 20 and 21 to shoot the 50 GI. As to the viability of the cartridge for use in self-defense, I'm not going to comment. You can draw your own conclusions on whether or not this is good or bad. The 50GI is definitely a neat idea and provides shooters who want the half-inch bore without the dramatic recoil with that reality. But here's where the failings become evident. Brass, dies, and bullets that are light enough to get a decent velocity in a short case? These aren't easy to find, and no one makes ammo outside of Guncrafter Industries themselves. Not to mention, they are pricey. Speaking of pricey, the 1911s they make for it are all $3,000 plus and the Glock conversion kit is $795 at the time of this video's release. And you'd still have to have bought a Glock 20 or 21 first. That's a lot of money to invest and the cartridge hasn't taken off or become anywhere near mainstream. This thing makes the 45 Gap look like it's the hot new cartridge. With the rarity of the guns and components and the prices involved to shoot it, 
the 50GI is not faring very well, and considering it has nothing else to sell it outside of being a 50 caliber, it's hard to justify getting into. Cool idea or not, this may be a cartridge best left on the drawing board. Number 3, the 40 Super. It really pains me to have to put the 40 Super on this list, but it hasn't had a good run. The 40 Super was the result of taking a 45 Win Mag casing and cutting it down to the length of a 10mm case, and then bottlenecking it to a 40 caliber. The pressure ceiling was set for factory ammo at 37,000 psi. The result was launching 200 grain bullets to a blazing 1,400 to 1,450 feet per second, exceeding a 10 millimeter by 150 to 200 feet per second. Use lighter bullets and the difference becomes larger. What a scorcher! But if anyone was asking for a cartridge to outdo the 10 millimeter in 1996 when the cartridge was designed, they weren't asking very loudly. Let's face it, how many people out there have actually complained that the ballistic performance of the 10 millimeter auto was lacking and needed a kick in the pants to make it more potent? Nobody that I've ever met. Well, maybe me. As you can imagine, with 10mm being known for a noticeable recoil, wearing out barrels, and putting strain on firearms with its high pressure, the 40 Super was only going to exacerbate these issues. At what point would most shooters just opt to get something with more power in a revolver built for the abuse like the 41 or 44 Magnum? Triton Cartridge Company, now gone, initially pitched the cartridge to Sig Sauer as a big brother to the then new 357 Sig as the 40 Sig, but they gave it a hard pass. Since then, few people are aware this cartridge even exists. The 40 Super is undoubtedly more powerful than the 10mm and makes for a great semi-auto hunting cartridge. But it's not a good choice for self-defense, and it's expensive to shoot as ammo suppliers are limited, and you need to beef up your gun, and then hunt down an aftermarket barrel company like Barstow to convert an existing firearm. No one has, to my knowledge, ever chambered a gun from the factory for this round. Unless, like Maverick, you feel the need for speed, you'd be better served by saving your money and the wear and tear on your gun by just buying a 10 millimeter. Number 2, the 414 Super Mag. Now here's an idea, performance-wise, that's actually a good one if people would be willing to get on board. But that's easier said than done, and when you start by building on a niche idea, don't expect people to flock to it. While the 41 Remington Magnum is an excellent cartridge, it has always been a cult favorite rather than a mainstream seller. The Super Mags were the idea of the late Elgin Gates, and the 414 Super Mag was the last one to be brought to market, with the others being the 357, the 375, and the 445. After Elgin's passing in 1988, his sons Robert and Randy wanted to make the 414 Super Mag a reality. It took time to produce the loading dies, to get Dan Wesson on board to build the gun, and to get the brass produced. Starline made the brass happen in 1993 and the 414 Super Mag was rolled out in 1994. The 414 Super Mag is a lengthened 41 Magnum, increasing brass length from 1.285 inches to 1.610 inches. The cartridge was geared towards handgun silhouette competitions by increasing the velocity and or bullet weight of the cartridge to knock down steel silhouettes with greater authority. And it did a great job at what it was designed to do. It could shoot a 210 grain bullet at an impressive 1,665 feet per second. That means lots of power and a flatter trajectory. But performance wasn't the reason this cartridge fell on hard times. Dan Wesson made only 25 of their 414 Super Mag chambered 7414 revolvers before they declared bankruptcy in 1995. The company was resurrected in 1996 and the 414 Super Mag was brought back in 1999. But it was discontinued again in 2005 when the company was bought by CZ after only making between 100 and 150 more. No one else has ever made a gun in this chambering, so they are a custom-only proposition if you can't find one of these very rare revolvers. So outside of a TC single-shot Encore pistol, this round is almost entirely rumor anymore. With a strong performance and the recoil equivalent to a 44 Magnum, it's no surprise why someone would want a cartridge like this. But making a specialty cartridge on an already seen as a specialty cartridge like the 41 Magnum is like trying to run a foot race while suffering from pneumonia. Winning is not a possibility. Number one. Drum roll, please. The 401 Herder's Power Mag. This cartridge is indeed a rare bird to see these days, but the question is naturally, why? The 401 Herder's Power Mag was the product of a company that sold outdoor hunting and shooting supplies by mail called Herder's. In 1961, they released a single-action revolver in three chamberings, the 357 Magnum, the 44 Magnum, and their proprietary 40 caliber, the 401 Herder's Power Mag. 
Since it was a proprietary round, notice how those keep ending up on these lists, Herders was the only place you could get it chambered from the factory. Herders had the revolvers made in West Germany, East was still behind the Iron Curtain at this time, by J.P. Sauer and Son, though they never put their name on the revolver itself. The design was decent for being just over half the cost of a Ruger Blackhawk at the time, and performed like a good single action should. The 401 Herders Power Mag had the standard magnum brass length of 1.285 inches and utilized a bullet that was .400 inches or .401, usually weighing 160, 180, or 200 grains. The velocities for 200 grains could be loaded as hot as 1,450 feet per second, so it was no slouch. For all intents and purposes, it was a 3840 Winchester Centerfire Magnum. Providing a middle ground between the 357 Magnum and the 44 Magnum was not a bad idea. So what made this cartridge go the way of the Dodo? It came down to a harsh one-two punch within four years of each other. In 1964, the 41 Remington Magnum hit the market and was chambered in revolvers made by Smith & Wesson and then Ruger. Not to mention there was greater support for the cartridge from ammo manufacturers. Like the 38 Super being eclipsed by the 357 Magnum in the 30s and the yet-to-come 40 Smith & Wesson overshadowing the 41 Action Express, the 401 Herders Power Mag now had competition that had a leg up on them in fighting for the same sales. The final blow was when the 1968 Gun Control Act banned the sale of firearms by mail straight to consumers. That hit Herders hard, and their single-action West German-made revolver was discontinued in 1971, taking the 401 Herders Power Mag with it. Today, people still shoot the caliber, as there is reloading equipment and some brass out there. I've heard that 41 Magnum brass can be resized and or you can modify 3030 brass, but I have no idea how well those options work myself. The 401 Herders Power Mag was a great middle ground cartridge that was done in by stiff competition and one of the only two enemies of firearms, rust and politicians. So let's recap that list before we go. Number 5, the 500 Wyoming Express, because Freedom Arms saw other 50 caliber cartridges and said, Me too! Number four, the 50 Guncrafter Industries. Rare, expensive, and unnecessary for the intended purpose. Number three, the 40 Super. Let's face it, if the 10mm gets a wrap for being too hot, who is going to buy this? Besides me. Number two, the 414 Super Mag. You can't make a better version of something that's underappreciated and expect it to succeed. And number one, the 401 Herders Power Mag. If you've even so much as heard of it before, then good for you. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the list. As I said at the beginning, this will probably be the last epic fail video on big bore cartridges we do, but that doesn't mean there aren't more out there. Do you think there was a cartridge we should have included? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe for more content. Your support really helps the channel. If you didn't enjoy the video, thank you for watching and giving us a chance. We really appreciate it. And as always, go big bore or go home. The 401 Herders Power Mag was a great middle ground cartridge that was done in by a stiff... by a stiffy. Do you find something funny about the word tromboner? <laughs>